And so the title of this project has changed over the years. This project's been going on for, I had a first Earthwatch team uh, when, right after I got my PhD in 1995, and I've had anywhere from four to eight per year ever since then. Uh, so there have been a lot of teams, and this, this project has evolved, and the title has changed frequently. Currently, I believe it's called Caterpillars and Climate Change, although they may have changed uh, the, the title again. The main PIs right now uh, are myself and, and Angela, who I mentioned you'll also be working with her. Uh, Smolanich, she's a um, research associate here at UNR. Uh, and uh, David Wagner, uh, who wrote the Eastern Caterpillars guidebook. You won't meet him here. He works with us at the Arizona site. And uh, I could list many other others who are actually PIs on this project, including Nick. Right, what we study uh, in the Caterpillars and Climate Change Project are multi-trophic interactions, so interactions between plants, uh, caterpillars or other herbivores, and natural enemies of caterpillars, predators and parasites that attack those caterpillars. And we do this work across the Americas with sites from Canada down, down to Brazil. Right? The natural enemies that we focus on are parasitoids, which are parasites that, uh, as part of their life cycle, kill their host. Right? There are a lot of different taxa that, that we call parasitoids, or that have this particular guild, this, uh, this sort of way of life, if you will. Uh, and and the, the important ones include nematodes, flies, and wasps. So the um, uh, or Nemata, Diptera, and Hymenoptera are the Latin names for those, the latter two being uh, orders of insects, and they're actually two of the, of the four most diverse orders of insects. Uh, are the three, three of the four we, we study are Lepidoptera, which are the moths, which are caterpillars, uh, Hymenoptera, which are wasps, among other things, and Diptera, which are flies. So uh, the life cycles of parasitoids are highly variable. There's a lot of different strategies. Uh, for example, flies don't have a sclerotized ovipositor, so they can't put eggs inside of a caterpillar. Uh, so they put their eggs outside of a caterpillar. Uh, they'll glue them on there, or they'll oviposit on a leaf surface. Some of them are kind of like bombers. They'll go flying over, and they'll drop eggs everywhere, and the caterpillar will eat those eggs. It will get in the gut, and then it'll hatch out in the gut and get across the gut and start eating tissue. Uh, in contrast, uh, parasitic hymenoptera have a sclerotized ovipositor that you might call sting. Right? So the females are the ones that sting you, say a wasp. Uh, this is an ichneumonid, and she uh, may have toxins in her stinger, just like other wasps do. Uh, but uh, she'll use that stinger to pierce the skin of a caterpillar and roll her eggs down in there. Uh, sometimes she might also put things like polyDNA or Blidna viruses inside of the caterpillar uh, or something to paralyze it for a short period of time while she gets the eggs in there. Uh, then the eggs will con uh, hatch out, consume the caterpillar. And then for both Diptera and Hymenoptera, uh, when they're ready to pupate, they, they will kill the caterpillar either by uh, bursting out like these Burkhanids are doing, different family than this, but still wasps. And then pupating, and this is what a pup pupa looks like of an ichneumonid, this is what pupae look like of burkhanids. Right? And so that's the part that kills the caterpillar typically. And but remember I said that the life histories are, are widely variable. They're or wildly variable is what I meant to say. Uh, so for example, some things don't burst out, they pupate inside of the caterpillar skin. But the thing that's, that's uh, pretty common among most taxa of parasitoids, it, of parasitoids that we call uh, quinobionts, that's a fancy word to mean that they develop along with their host, is that they'll eat non-essential tissues uh, until they're ready to pupate. Meaning they'll eat hemolymph and fat body and things that aren't necessary for the caterpillar uh, in order for it to continue eating. And then right when they're ready to pupate, they'll eat everything, the brain, the heart, and they kill it at that point. And often, you know, emerging in pretty dramatic fashion, like these are done. Sometimes they'll parasitize an egg and come out of a larva, uh, or they'll parasitize a larva and come out of a pupa, which is what we call a 
larval pupil parasitoid, and on and on. So there's many variations on the theme of how parasitism happens. And then there are also parasitoids that are hyperparasitoids, and those are parasitoids of parasitoids. So this is in the family Chalcididae, and what Chalcids do is they, so that particular one we reared out in Costa Rica, um, so the, the, the uh, female that laid eggs looked like this. She landed on a big fat caterpillar, it's a, a hornworm, and she listened with her feet, and she heard a, that there was a fly in there. And if there wasn't a fly in there, she'd fly away. But she heard the fly was in there, then she stuck her arm positor into the caterpillar, and then into the fly larva, and parasitized the fly. So we knew that there were flies in there, because they put these bruises on the side, uh, but then we got all these wasps out because of the type of parasitized. So that's a very, very brief introduction to parasitoids, and I'm sure you'll have questions. You can ask now. Yeah, uh, Melissa, right? No. Kelly. 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 Oh, sorry, um, Melissa. So Melissa. I make sure okay. that I'm just yeah. following uh -huh. the rest of this What's that? Oh, yeah. oh so, so uh, whole metabolous insects are groups. So there are 30 orders of insects. The, the class Insecta uh, has 30 orders. Nine of those orders are what we call endopteria goats, where they have internally developing, um, in the lar larval stage, they have internally developing adult structures that are just sort of like little embryos. And those orders of insects, so the ones that you're probably most familiar with are the beetles and butterflies and moths and wasps and flies, they have an egg, larval, pupil, and adult stage. And so the egg stage often looks like this, and it's also an embryo, sort of like a seed of a plant. And the larval stage often looks like this. Uh, when I give the uh, lecture to you about caterpillars, so in a few days I'm going to give you a caterpillar lecture where I tell you how to tell a caterpillar from something else and how to distinguish the 120 different families of caterpillars. Uh, but the larval stage uh, is pretty distinct from, from uh, caterpillars, are pretty distinct from others. But this is the feeding stage, though, whether you're a moth or a wasp or a fly, the larval stage is the feeding stage. The pupil stage is where those little discs that I talked about, that are called magnal discs, the little embryos inside, start developing. All the other cells die, and it reorganizes. So this is what this is. This is reorganizing its tissues to become an adult. So some people might call, uh, like in a butterfly, they use the common term chrysalis. That's a pupa. Or a cocoon, which is basically a pupa inside a bunch of silk that the last larval one star spun. So you've got an egg stage, larval stage, pupil stage, and adult stage for insects that have complete metamorphosis. And that's just nine of 30 orders. But it's the nine most successful. That was a long-winded answer to a simple question, but that's what a pupa is. So this is an example of a pupa of a, of a butterfly. Right? Or you could call it a chrysalis. Okay. So wasps are just, are just like you know, butterflies. They have those, those uh, four stages, at least. All right. So for this project, uh, we or actually just in our lab, uh, there are a lot of big questions that, that drive what we do. Uh, and this isn't all of them, but these are some of the big questions that we'll never answer, uh, but that sort of drive our research. And so in the short time we're here, we're not going to get an answer to any of these questions. Uh, but this is our goal, and it's good to sort of know what our grand goal is and sort of our, uh, our, our uh, idea that, that we may contribute to these kinds of questions. Uh, like this one, as scient you know, scientists will never know the answer to this question, unfortunately. How many species are there in the world? Um, does anybody know how many species we think there are? 4,000? Um, that's, that's a big, we've, we've described about a million already. So, um, so more than that. But oh. it's a good starting point, good guess. Well, I, how many species of caterpillars are you asking about, right? Of anything. Oh, because oh, I, I thought, is there about 4,000 species of caterpillars or? Right now, there's uh, of caterpillars, there's about 180,000 described species wow. of, of moths. The immatures are not uh, are not known for most of the named species. Right? So there's right now there's about 1.4 million described species of multicellular organisms. Right? Mm -hmm. But 
Billion or billion? Million, million. Okay. Billion's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, there aren't that many species. A uh, billion, nobody would, would estimate that many. All right, so 1.4 million are described. They have formal names. Uh, like, you know, um, uh, like, I don't know if you know, well, like Homo sapiens is a formal name, Latin binomial. Or Papilio antisiades is a, is a swallowtail butterfly. All right, so there's 1.4 million names like that. Right. Estimates go from, from of how many there really are from 3 million to 80 million. Somewhere in there is the true number. So we, 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 there are a lot that we haven't named, most of them. Even if you're on the low estimate, even if you think there's only 4 million species, we're only, uh, you know, we, we've, uh, we've only done one quarter of all the species. We've only discovered them or put names on them. Right? But this is kind of a big question. And it's an interesting question just from a pure scientific point of view, but it's also an important question if you're interested in conservation or if you're concerned about massive loss of biodiversity. Because the fact is we don't know what we're losing. We're losing diversity very quickly, you know, all over the world by, uh, you know, habitat fragmentation, climate change, um, invasive species, and a variety of other things that are uh, threatening uh, biodiversity. Right, so this, I think, is a, is a huge question that, unfortunately, we won't answer because we are leaving, losing habitat very quickly, and because there's actually no funding for taxonomy, which is the science that names species. Right, taxonomists just can't get jobs anymore. There's no funding for them. But this is something that we work on, all right? And we're, we are focused on caterpillars and their parasitoids and plants. We actually, our project has found new species of plants. Uh, but we're interested overall in this question. How did they evolve? And I'm going to go through every one of these questions. How many, how many, why are there so many species in the tropics? And what are the causes and consequences of high biodiversity, high specialization, and high chemical diversity? And then finally, how do diverse ecosystems respond to global change? Uh, again, I'm not going to go through every one of these questions, but those are some examples of some of the big questions that drive our work. But let's talk about really the nuts and bolts of, of this project and some of the specific questions that we're trying to address. And then at the end of this project, I'm going to give you another talk where I talk about the data that you, you collected as a group. And we'll sort of discuss, OK, what do you all think we can do with this data? We'll talk a little bit about it. And then I'll bring it back to some of these big questions. Say, so, well, for example, you know, how many species questions we could, we could contribute in this way, you know, x, y, and z. Well, let's talk nuts and bolts about our project. So our project. Uh, the basic method is very simple. We collect caterpillars from Brazil up to Canada, uh, and we put them in bags and rear them out and see what comes out. Right? So it's pretty simple. It doesn't sound like rocket science. And it's not. It's, it's straightforward, uh, but not many people do this. And for a lot of reasons, I think it's a, a very effective method for answering some of those big questions uh, that I showed you. So we have sites. Uh, where Earthwatch volunteers go, we have five sites. Uh, those sites are in Ecuador, Costa Rica, Louisiana, Arizona, uh, the Great Basin, um, and Sierra Nevada. Um, so did I get all the sites? Yeah. Um, so those are our five Earthwatch sites. Then we have uh, sites that we've established in Brazil. We have a large database, a 30-year database from Canada, and then collaborators doing our same method across the eastern uh, across the East Coast, in particular, uh, Dave Wagner. So we're doing this work, the exact work that you do here, we're doing at all of these other sites concurrently. So right now, uh, we have a full-time crew in Ecuador doing this. Uh, there are a bunch of graduate students from Brazil who are doing this exact same thing in, in Brazil. So we can pool all these data and address some of these, these bigger questions, especially questions like, why are there so many species in the tropics? All right, so uh, since the title of this uh, project has the, the, the phrase climate change in it. Uh, I'll, I'll start by telling you how we use these kind of data. How, so how, uh, how is it that putting caterpillars in bags and seeing what comes out is related to questions about climate change? So let's jump right into that. And the, the first way I approached, in our lab, the first way we approached studying climate change uh, was to do some climate change experiments. And experiments are really useful. Right? And, and uh, we won't do any of these experiments as a group on Earthwatch, but there were Earthwatchers that contributed to these experiments. And what we did is we, had, we created these little ecosystems where we had tritrophic interactions. We had plants, 
caterpillars and parasitoids. And the plant was alfalfa, the caterpillar were cutworms, Spodoptera frigiperda, the parasitoids were braconids, called Cotesia, the name of these. And we made these little ecosystems, some of which just had plants, some had plants and caterpillars, and some had plants, caterpillars, and parasitoids. And then in some ecosystems, we bumped up, we, we either had, you know, we crossed two things, ambient and high CO2 and ambient and high temperature. So we had four different environments. Uh, if you cross those two things, you get four little cells. And we had all of those types of environments. And within those environments, we had the three different types of ecosystems. So we could ask a lot of questions about how climate change affects multi-trophic interaction. We also did a lot of chemistry on these plants because one of the things that we're, we know happens when you bump up the temperature or bump up CO2 is plant chemistry changes, which then affects caterpillar chemistry and, and affects parasitoids. Right. This um, project actually was destroyed. Uh, we, we ran it for about three years in our laboratories in New Orleans. I used to be a professor at Tulane University in New Orleans. And um, uh, right, everything, all, all of our results were going into the freezer for chemical analysis and weighing and everything else. And uh, just because when you're running an experiment like this, it's a, it takes, it's a, this was a massive experiment with lots of chambers. What you do is you get everything into the freezer, dry everything out, and then do all your analyses when, uh, you know, as, as time goes on. Uh, so we got hit by Hurricane Katrina and, um, and lost these experiments. And we've actually just redone them. It took about five years to redo them. But the reason I tell you this is that um, it was actually a very fortunate event in some ways because it allowed us, it sort of forced us to say, okay, we can't do this anymore. Uh, but it forced us to think about this idea. Models of climate change have predicted a greater frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. Things like droughts and floods. And incidentally, if you're wondering what this is, this is the only funny thing I can say that happened to me at Katrina is uh, uh, this is a this is a frozen turkey. Um, and I was uh, I got back into New Orleans and uh, about four days after Katrina, and I was standing in really disgusting water up to my waist in front of my house, and that turkey went floating by. <laughs> and I just thought it was really funny. <laughs> so I took a picture of it. And uh, to me, that turkey was like was the only you know other positive thing that I can say about Katrina. But uh, right after Katrina, though, right after I saw actually almost a month after I saw this turkey float by, uh, I saw this figure, uh, which showed uh, that these models from the 90s empirical data were showing that these models were correct. Uh, so this is an example where they found that the number of Category 4 and 5 hurricanes had doubled over the past 30 years. Right? And in fact, this change, which has been studied a lot more since this figure was published, uh, was a greater change even than what these models have predicted. Right? And, and now if you look at subsequent papers, what most climate scientists agree on is that, uh, is that there won't be a more extreme weather events, it's just that extreme weather events will be more intense. So in other words, they're not predicting more hurricanes, they're predicting stronger Category 4 or stronger Category 5 hurricanes, or shifting up from a 3 to 4 or from a 4 to a 5, right? and, which is exactly the kind of thing that they're seeing with empirical data. So with that in mind, so you know, after Katrina, I had to live in, I, we lived in Houston for, for uh, about six months uh, before they let us move back. And, uh, and I couldn't really do those experiments, but I was still interested in climate change. And I was thinking, well, extreme weather events, and uh, you know, I, I thought I had a lot of data uh, from across the Americas where in, at some of our sites we have extreme weather events. It's like in New Orleans where we've been working for a number of years before Katrina hit. And so I was talking to my postdoc and I said, you know, we could look across our sites and use geography as a proxy for time. We can kind of look into the future because we can say, okay, Here's sites that are stable, and then here's sites that have a lot of hurricanes and floods and droughts and stuff like that. We say, what happens to tritrophic interactions when you get more extreme weather? Right? So what we did is we took 17 sites across the Americas, uh, and central to those sites were our Earthwatch sites. And we asked the question, uh, for sites that have more extreme weather, uh, is there anything that we can see that happens to tritrophic interactions? 
And there are a lot of things, but one of the most important things for our project, for our Earthwatch project, uh, is that parasitism, okay, so levels of, of parasitism declines as, the, as uh, the incidence of extreme weather events increases. And I'll explain this variable to you uh, right now. So this is a, a measure of extreme weather events that's very simple. It's year-to-year -year variation in rainfall. Right, so that means that if you have a site where, like in Arizona, where you have a flood one year and a drought the next year, so you have a huge monsoon. Anybody have been to Arizona? To, to where? Where? In Phoenix. In Phoenix. Okay, so you know the monsoon season, right? You can have a really big one. It's a little more pronounced, a little like in the Chiricahuas where we work. But you can have a huge monsoon season, or you can just have a dry year. Right, so extremely variable from year to year. In Ecuador, anybody have been to Ecuador? Parasite in Ecuador, it's a cloud forest. It gets four meters of rain, rain every single year. Hardly any variation. All right, so here's Ecuador. That's our Earthwatch site there. Uh, here's our site in Costa Rica. Here's our site in New Orleans. Uh, here's uh, the Arizona site. You can see our Earthwatch sites actually cover the full range of this variation. The Great Basin site, or the site you're at right now is over on this side. Okay, a lot of variation, even though it's low rainfall. Okay, so each one of these dots is a site, and as you can see, as you move towards extreme weather, you get lower levels of parasitism. Okay, there's a few things I can say about this. One is that uh, we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking about the mechanism. So why is it that this happens? And we also predicted that you'd get more outbreaks of caterpillars at these sites over here, which, which is, in fact, what we're finding. Right, so our idea was that this thing called phenological asynchrony, it's kind of a, a fancy phrase, but it's a really simple idea, and that is that uh, we're delinking parasitoids from their hosts. These guys are very delicate. If you try to rear them in labs, it's really hard. They live for, what, one or two days. They come out, and if a caterpillar's not there, they die. Right? And it's amazing that there are so many species and that they're successful because they're really wimpy. And so if there's a flood, the caterpillars are fine. They're just, you know, hanging out under the soil, or they'll do something. They'll pupate early, they'll wait a few years. You can have a pupa for like three years. So they'll just do whatever, they don't care. Whereas the wasp will just die. Right? So what it does is it delinks the wasp from the host. So when it comes out, if there's been a flood, the, the host is hunkering down, it's in the wrong stage, the wasp dies. Right? So if that's true, this shouldn't be true for flies because flies tend to be generalists and they'll attack anything. Remember I said some flies bomb their eggs wherever and then the caterpillars will eat those. It doesn't matter what caterpillar, just any caterpillar. So we thought to test this mechanism we could take the flies out of our data set. So this is total percent parasitism. It's kind of a messy relationship. It's, it's strong but it's a little bit messy. When we take the flies out, it becomes much tighter. Even with this outlier here, which is a Maryland site, which had some problems, but the R squared, or the amount of variance explained, uh, was, uh, was 78%, which is huge for ecological data, meaning that 78% of the parasitism by wasps was explained by this variable, this extreme weather event variable. Lee, can I just ask one question? Yeah. yeah. Can you go back to the last slide? Mm -hmm. Did not go back there. Yeah. Do you know all the people that are that are uh, listed there? You, 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 I'm assuming you're working with all the people that are listed here. Yeah, those are they're all my collaborators. So is W. Hallwax? Is that Winifred Hallwax? That's Winnie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So these are all the people. So this was my postdoc, and then these are this is me, and then this is everybody that uh, I worked with to get all the data together and that use our method. Uh, so Dan and Winnie have worked with us since the 90, early 90s. Uh, so do you know Winnie? She's a college classmate. Uh, oh, okay. Then, so from years ago. Yeah, well, she's Dan Jansen's wife, too. Okay. So, uh, yeah. yeah, but that's, uh, she goes by Winnie now, but yeah, it's one of the... Yeah, yeah no, I know Winnie. she goes by, she went by Winnie back then. Oh, okay, I was right. just, uh, Yeah, that's exactly who that is. So that's, I knew she uh, kind of did something like this, but uh, this is the first time I've seen her name. No, they so. have, Dan and Winnie, they have the biggest caterpillar database in the world. So they, yeah, they're, they're, uh, they're awesome. 
So yeah, that's exactly who that is. And that's the, their site is this one right here, the ACG wet and the ACG dry, these two sites. Okay, so this was this was kind of a big deal, this this because you know Katrina hit and then there was Hurricane Rita and there were all these big <coughs> hurricanes and all these records were being broken and so my research is pretty esoteric and doesn't get a lot of attention from the media too much. Uh, but when we published this, like I was on NPR and the BBC and like there was these articles in the New York Times about it. It, was, it got a lot of attention because one of the things we predicted is, you know, outbreaks, especially in agriculture. Uh, and this, and whenever you show a graph like this, like if you're a science teacher, it's good to sort of talk about what, what the biological significance is if it's a graph biological graph. And this is huge. If you drop from about 12% parasitism to about 3% parasitism in an agricultural field, in a rainforest, in a desert, in the mountains, you're going to get big, huge outbreaks. It's a really big deal. And if, you, if you've ever read anything about biocontrol, or you, know, you may have heard, well, it doesn't work. It, it actually does work. Uh, it's, there are many instances where it doesn't, if it's not used correctly. but uh, uh, but the fact is that even if it's not being actively managed for biological control, if you bring natural enemies out of an ecosystem, you'll get outbreaks. Uh, it happens, you know, there's, there's uh, literally thousands of documented instances of this. So because we predicted that, it made a big splash. And remember, some of these were live interviews, and I remember talking to the, the guy from the BBC, and he asked me, well, so this is kind of a biblical thing where you get uh, you know, uh, you get pestilence and plague, you know, followed by, you know, the, the locusts coming and it said, well, you know, not, not really, not exactly, but if you were to get rid of all the parasitoids in the world, if you're going to go down to zero parasitism, it would be more profound than any, any of the biblical stories. And it would be a, a really big deal uh, because parasitoids are the ones who are responsible for keeping the world green. That it's not just caterpillars, they attack locusts, they attack grasshoppers, they attack any insect or boar that you can imagine, including grain pests, are attacked by parasitoids. So this is something that once we published this and started thinking more about it, uh, we decided as a group that this should be a, another focus for our research. And incidentally, I don't have the data here because I'm going to move on to something else, but uh, let me just back up for a second. We recently have figured out that from, um, from these experiments, that temperature and CO2 do the same thing. And we're, we're just uh, submitting to, to science uh, this paper, dang, I went too far, um, where what we found out with this is that heating up these ecosystems, uh, in a regular ecosystem, if you put parasitoids in, uh, the biomass of alfalfa and the chemistry of alfalfa was much better. So the so the biomass was, was double with the parasitoids. Uh, the chemistry, the, the levels of these supplements, which are toxins, was cut in half. However, if you sped them up by increasing the temperature or the CO2, you also got that fancy thing, phenological asynchrony. What happened is that these grew too fast. And the parasitoids died before uh, they, uh, I mean, the caterpillars pupated before the parasitoids could finish development. So you got this massive difference in biomass and leaf quality for this you know, ubiquitous plant at the higher CO2 and temperature. So it's kind of a double whammy. Uh, carbon dioxide and temperature and extreme weather events are all bad for parasitoids. So we thought that this would be a really important thing for us to focus on uh, to, to try to understand and, and, and try to help provide advice to you know, how can we, you know, in a changing world, you know, how can we prepare, especially in agricultural systems or if you're a managed natural ecosystem, uh, for this idea that you're going to get uh, much lower levels of parasitism uh, in the future. If you sort of, if this really happens, if we get an increase in extreme weather. So what do we do to mitigate? Yeah. Right, so that's a big focus of our project now. And to those questions, you need a ton of data, right? And uh, a lot of different, a lot of different attacks to a question like this, and that's what Okay, so that's, that's a, big, a big focus. Uh, so if we were in New Orleans at the site there, uh, you might be participating in some of these experiments where, so we had the big flood at Katrina, but there what we do is we simulate this kind of storm surge, because there'll be more floods like that there, I have no doubt. 
uh, and in other coastal areas, this kind of thing will, will happen again. So we make these big copper dams and we flood ecosystems. So this is a natural salt mall marsh that we flooded. We know all the caterpillars and all the herbivores that eat the, the uh, plants in there. So we flood it and we see if our predictions are correct, if we get lower parasitism or you know, various other predictions that we've come up with. Okay. Tired? Are people tired? Good thing you don't have the second talk that you have to do. <laughs> so, um, any questions at this point? There's just one other so that, That's sort of the first half of the talk, so you're doing good. We're halfway through it. Yeah. Um, Melissa. Um, uh, no. <laughs> that seems to be a favorite name. <laughs> I know. No. Try again. Latif. Latif, right. Yeah. You're um, Melissa. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Oh, um, what is this? Why does the CO2 and temperature change from the Why does it affect the moss? Well, because the um, it doesn't really directly affect them. As far as we know, we, we didn't really test that. But it speeds up the caterpillars. Just because so they have more to feed on? Or? Well, temperature is, it speeds up development of most insects. Okay. Um, so the caterpillars' uh, development goes way faster. Parasitoids are a lot more restricted in their development. They're living inside their host. Mm -hmm. In general, parasitoids are wimps. And so the caterpillars pupate before the parasitoids are ready. And then they can't do it. It's too late. What about yeah. the CO2? CO2 has the same, and it's more complicated, but it also speeds up caterpillar development. But there's also a change. That's because it's a lot more complicated because that's because it, change, it changes the plant chemistry, which changes the way the caterpillars feed. So it's a lot more indirect how it changes their development. Okay. Um, but, but that's something that we, we're going to do a lot more of those chamber experiments, like with other species of caterpillars, to see if this is sort of a general thing. Because uh, if it's both those things, then you know, in, in agriculture in particular, we really need to start thinking about you know, these, these things are happening, we can't stick our heads in the sand and pretend they're not. So because we depend on these parasitoids, we have to figure out, okay, how can we mitigate for that? You know, what, you know there are some parasitoids that do better under these conditions, or you know, what, what else can we do? Mm -hmm. Okay, so just to clarify, so caterpillar, if caterpillars start pupating before the parasite pupates, then the parasites, like, die and don't... Yeah, so unless it's a larval, so, so that's part of the reason why I go in a little bit into life histories of parasitoids. So some parasitoids attack the larva and come out as a larva, and that's sort of standard. Like a lot of the ones we use for biocontrol, that's what they do. And so they're good at killing caterpillars. Others are larval pupil, but that's what they do. And so when you, uh, so your question was good about what's a pupa, because a pupa, to get there, most of the cells inside of the caterpillar go through programmed cell death. They all die. So if you're a parasitoid, you're part of that mass die-off. The only things that live are the little imaginal discs, the little embryos that are in there that become adult parts. So that's what happens in the parasitoids. When the caterpillar pupates too fast, they get killed with everything else, with all these reorganizing tissues. So the, you, you think the caterpillar going to a butterfly, right? Mm -hmm. that there has to be major reorganization, and that's what kills the parasitoid. So the parasitoid needs to get out of there, you know, before that starts happening. It needs to eat everything and pop out and pupate. So that's what, and, and it's different from the extreme weather event thing. It's a different kind of asynchrony. Um, wait a second. Well, we both have our hand up, so I don't know. Yeah, I can, yeah, I can get Melissa's not in the room. Melissa's, Melissa's not in the room. Where did no. she go? Right um, so, uh, Stephanie, yeah. right? Stephanie. And then, uh, Judith. Okay. Yeah. Do you go by Judith or Judy? Judith. 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 Okay. Oh, I was just going to ask, about how long would you have to look at the variation in the weather to consider it climate change? Um, and that's not, that's a question for a, a climate change scientist more more than for me. I, I, the, I mean, but I'm also a statistician, and I, I mean, for me, uh, I'm I'm good with. With if you can if you can establish a, a a mean that doesn't have you know over a long period of, long enough period of time, uh, which you know a couple hundred years is is pretty good for getting a solid mean and a and a normal variance, uh, then you can I would say you know anything that's that's a you know one standard deviation away from that is is massive climate change. Um, that's just sort of an off the cuff. Well, I'm not a climate scientist, but I am a statistician, and, and 
I, w I would have actually a much more, uh, I mean, as a statistician, uh, I would have a much less stringent cutoff to say, oh, this is, this is a big, you know, something's going on here. You know, because I'm trained to find patterns. And, yeah. and uh, that's, that's what I do. And usually I, I deal with data that are way messier than, the, than what the climate change scientists have. They have data that are like, Pretty, compared to my data, they're like crystal clear. It's like, oh, this is this is a really strong signal. Uh, so, so yeah, it's, I didn't really answer your question because I'm not. That's not what I do. Yeah. I'm focused more on the consequences of, of the climate change. Yeah. But it's a good question. Um, uh, yeah, that's why I took your pictures. <laughs> Judith, I just to ask you what your name was. Yes. Um, one of the first slides um, had a pic actually. It's um, it had a lot of the pictures with different um, parasites, uh, but um, there was one that you you mentioned that the wasp would would actually detect whether there was already a fly in the caterpillar. Yeah, <coughs> hyperparasitoid. Yeah. So, but what, what what was the name of that one? Hyperparasitoid. Hyperparasitoid. Yeah. No, why it is? Why would it um, choose the fly and not the caterpillar? Is it just a matter of? of just their preference or? Yeah, it, it, insects are typically very specialized. <laughs> Even so, so um, at that level, they're all specialized. So, so like, you know, caterpillars that, you know, the order of left doctor, almost all of them eat plants. Mm -hmm. That's what they got to eat plants. And so a generalist doesn't mean that it eats plants and maybe some other stuff. Uh, it means that it eats a whole bunch of different kinds of plants. Uh, so a, a uh, a wasp that's a chalcid, um, you know, there, there, there are subfamilies that, you know, they just attack fly larvae that are inside of caterpillars, and that's what they do, and that's what they're hard, hardwired to do. So if that egg ended up in a caterpillar, the metabolism of the larva that hatched out couldn't deal with these, these tissues are really different. Okay. They're wrong amino, wrong amino acids, wrong fats, everything's wrong. So it would be like you suddenly had to just eat linseed oil or something. You wouldn't do very well. So that's, that's a good question, too. Um, is there another team somewhere else working on a similar study, like in Europe, Asia, Africa? or? Yeah, so I have a, a friend who we often have different conclusions in the literature, so people don't realize we're friends. But um, his name is Wojta Novotny, and he's doing very similar work in Papua New Guinea and in, and in the Czech Republic. He's from the Czech, Czech Republic. So is there data consistent with the, the, the findings here? Or there His parasitism data, he just started collecting. A, we met um, a, a while back, and he was just collecting the caterpillar data and uh, just parasitoid diversity data. And so he's just starting, his parasitism data is just starting to come out. Uh, but he, after we met, you know, I changed some of my methods, he changed some of his. And we, we had sort of opposite conclusions about some things, but the parasitism data he hasn't had out yet. So Papua New Guinea is a little different uh, because it's, it's a big island, but it's still an island, and, and it's a different kind of lowland rainforest than what you get in the Amazon or Congo Basin. Uh, but that's a whole other story. Uh, your question's really good because there are... I mean, it's amazing. You know, Africa, the Congo Basin has incredible diversity, but very few people doing this kind of work there. Almost nobody. It's all butterfly stuff. And the butterflies, when I give you the caterpillar talk, you'll see they're, they're just one very small group of the whole, of all the moths. Butterflies are special moths. They're moths that fly during the day. There's only like seven families of butterflies. Uh, so uh, the, most of the work in Africa is just with those seven families of butterflies. Is there any interest in trying to collaborate and to try to extend the, the, the data there because it would seem yeah. conditions in the Congo you know, area yeah. would be like in no, South America. I would, I would love it if somebody would do this. I, I, just, you know, I, I sort of reached my own limits at you know, how many places I could travel to. After, after I went to Brazil and Peru, I was like, okay, that, I can't go anywhere else. I, I don't even like traveling. You know? <laughs> so, um, so I'm done. You know, and my, actually, Wojta tried to get me to go to Papua New Guinea, and I was like, no, 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 I'll get malaria. Because uh, <laughs> he's, he's had both kinds of malaria, and a lot of it forever. And he told me that the medicine man could do like a little dance over me or something. And I was like, no, I don't want malaria. So they have the enough kind of resistant malaria there. So I'm not going there, but I'd love it if, if the real answer to your question is yes. 
there could be interest, but nobody's doing it right now, and I would, I would be awesome if, if people started doing this kind of work, and, uh, especially in the Congo Basin. But, but Voita is doing it in Papua New Guinea, which is another, you look sort of the three hot spots of biodiversity, they're in the Amazon Basin, the Congo Basin, and the Papua New Guinea. Those are, those are where the lowland, the big lowland rainforest across a major river are, are located. I have another question. Uh -huh. um, in the places where there's a lot of climatic change, do you guys also find like more evolved or like specialized plants because there's more caterpillars to eat them? Or? So what we're talking about here are, are so if you look at our x-axis on that on that graph, uh, that's that's a um, those are data from uh, anywhere from 20 to a couple hundred years that generate that x-axis. So it's very very short periods of time that we're talking mm -hmm. about here. So that doesn't mean so the the uh, Yanayaku site, you know, 10,000 years ago, it wasn't four meters of rain every year. Mm -hmm. So it's a little less, it's not as simple as that. It's, uh, so this is more recent, a recent ecological question that we're addressing. Okay. You're asking an evolutionary question that takes into Just account a lot more sense. climatic differences. Yeah. So, and it is something that we'll talk about in, in this project. We, we do address evolutionary questions. So let's get to that, um, this part, then, diversity. And one of the things that I also think that we've, we're, we're failing at is, or that we're sort of losing sight of is, is understanding diversity and understanding that we're experiencing a biodiversity crisis or a change in biodiversity. You don't have to even call it a crisis if you want to be sort of an impartial observer. It's a change that's profound. Uh, and it, it's something that kind of gets, um, it gets eclipsed by all the discussion of climate change that we're facing this massive loss of biodiversity. And I, I, I think that a lot of the general public doesn't think about it much, the fact that we're losing species very, very, very quickly. And we don't know how many species are, are out there. And this variable is the one that I find the most fascinating in all of the sciences. So I, was, I got a degree in English and biochemistry. I didn't know if I wanted to do science or be a writer. Uh, didn't know if I wanted to do chemistry or biology. And I finally you know, decided on, on biology. And of all the questions in sciences, I found understanding biodiversity the most fascinating. And it's a really difficult issue because uh, if you go to a patch of rainforest, for example, uh, there, are, there are literally thousands of species in a very small area, an area the size of, of Reno. And we don't understand exactly why there's so many more species in Costa Rica than there are in Reno. We have a lot of good ideas and a lot of hypotheses that have been tested and supported, but we still don't know exactly why. We d really don't know what it means to lose diversity. We have no idea what it means to lose diversity. So this is our other big focus. And what we do in our lab is we study a different kind of diversity. We study diversity of ecological interactions. And so we're not counting up species. We're counting up interactions. And this is kind of a, and this concept is a really difficult concept. It's something that we've pushed and we've published a lot recently now about interaction diversity and what it means and how you document it. And so this is really cutting edge stuff that you all will be working on. It's a new idea for ecology. Even though Dan Jansen, uh, who's Winnie's husband, uh, back in the 70s wrote about diversity of ecological interactions, he was thinking of it in a more abstract way. What we're trying to do is quantify it. And I agree with Dan is that the extinction of ecological interactions is a pretty big deal. And so this is the kind of thing we study. We're focused on uh, plant, caterpillar, or enemy interactions, but interaction diversity can include things like plant pollinator interactions. All right, so, um, and I'll just skip this for a second. Um, let me just briefly go into, uh, and I, you know what, I, I have to take this call next because um, my son's gonna be dropped off with me here in a minute, so. Uh, we're starting a lot later than we were supposed to be starting, so he'll have to come in and listen to this. He hates listening to my talks, but he'll have to come in and listen to the rest of those. So, um, how, so the, for those of you who are, who've taught biology, when you when you teach ecology, what what is uh, how do you explain diversity? What what is how do we measure diversity normally? What's the normal measure of biodiversity? Total number. 
of species and roles in the ecosystem? Total yeah. number of species, that's a good one. Just so we count up species. That, that, if you read the primary literature where diversity is one of the words in there, usually they're talking about the number of species. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not really the only thing about diversity, but there are a lot of other types of diversity that we're getting good at measuring, like genetic diversity, which is something we do as well in our lab. But, uh, but usually, talking about the number of species. And so if you go to a place like La Selva, biological station, which this isn't, this is Reno, uh, in Costa Rica, where we started our, our first Earth Watch teams in 95, this is the size of La Selva, 1,600 hectares. This is Reno. La Selva can fit inside of Reno. So you can see this is just part of Reno here. We're like right over here. Um, and this is just a, this, this is what 1,600 hectares looks like. At La Selva, uh, the number of species, or species richness, the most common measure of diversity, uh, is really high. So there are, there are over 2,000 species of plants. There's 1,600 species of flowering plants in, a, in an area that, that, you know, that can fit inside of Reno. There are some of the plants that are... Oh, I don't turn it. Uh -huh. What's that in the bottom line? It's a person's head. That's one of my first students that went down to the tropics. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's her, and then that's the big plant there. <laughs> it's a really oh, photogenic. I was just trying to see if you were paying attention. <laughs> a new species, right? Yeah, it is, yeah. So that's a very interesting spider. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's a very photogenic plant, actually. A lot of people do that. But yeah, that was actually my very first undergraduate that I took to, uh, to Costa Rica. Uh, so the, these are just some of my favorite plants from, uh, this one's awesome, Dipterx panamensis. It's a 40 meter tall emerging tree. So, um, so that's what you know. So that's one way that people say that Costa Rica is diverse. There's a lot of species there, right? There's, uh, if we look at animals too, uh, other than that person on that last slide, if we look at uh, other mammals, uh, there are um, 116 species of mammals at La Selva. Um, a lot of them happen to be bats. Uh, there are 48 species of amphibians. Uh, there are 86 species of reptiles. 406 species of birds on the species list. Uh, Oh, I think this is Cam. No, nope, it was okay. And uh, this is actually not a reptile here. This is a uh, this is an instead of if you're interested in some of these, this is a bushmaster, really poisonous snake. This is a poison dart frog in the radius uh, But this is not a reptile. This is a caterpillar. See, there's its head. There's its mouth parts. There's its legs. First abdominal segment. Uh, I'll show you this again when we do caterpillar morphology in a few days. Uh, I have no idea how many species of caterpillars there are in the cell, but uh, there are, I've estimated there's about 7,000 species there in that small area. How That's, many are there here in the, the Great Basin? Um, well, in the, in the Great Basin, which extends all the way out to Colorado, don't have any idea either. So, the, so there are new species of moths to be found still. There's a couple issues. One is that, so, so, so we've heard about 3,500 species of caterpillars. A lot of the moths already had names on them, but a lot of them didn't. They were new species. We'll have the same thing happening here. So I'll get back to your question in, in, in one second, but that is, it's, a, it's a really good question. I'm pretty sure there's 7,000 species there, and we can get names on most of the species of plant. Uh, or we can do it per unit area. So when you do a plot, what we're trying to do is figure out in a certain area, so we can go to La Selva, and we can say a 10 meter diameter circle. We're going to look, count every species of plant and collect every caterpillar off of it and see if any of them yield parasitoids. And so in a plot, we might have something like this, three plant species, two herbivores, both of which only eat, uh, you know, one of which eats two plants, the other one of which eats one plant, and two parasitoids. We can count up these lines because we know they're there. We collected them, we documented them. So that's what we're doing. Right? It's a very simple metric, uh, but we, we're also doing a lot of math behind this because we, we, ecology is based on mathematical modeling. And so we have a bunch of models that predict what, what interaction diversity will do, for example, as you go closer to the tropics. And it's a variable that's really different from species diversity. Right? But what we think, and our models are testing this, and our empirical data will test this, is that uh, as you go up a gradient, uh, or you, you go up a gradient in diversity, so for example, uh, when there's more, over here you have more species of plants, that interaction diversity will increase more than regular diversity. And, and the next figure is more uh, important. It takes a while to, to explain that particular model, but more importantly, we think that 
perturbations, and it doesn't have to be climate change, it can be invasive species uh, or other types of perturbations, uh, will affect interaction diversity a lot greater than, than species diversity. So the dotted line here is interaction diversity, the solid line is species diversity. Uh, so uh, according to our modeling and, uh, and our, our um, just understanding of natural history, uh, we think this variable is a lot more susceptible to uh, things like, like climate change. Um, okay, and I'm gonna, that's going to be the last slide. I just wanted to mention that we do have a lot of other hypotheses we test, a lot of other projects going on. So Angela, whom you just met, uh, will be talking a lot more about some of our evolutionary hypotheses and some very cool work that she can show you about about how she looks at, um, I'm going to just fly through this to just show you what's going on here, um, about how she looks at this process called encapsulation, where she, um, she injects these beads into caterpillars uh, to see how the immune system is affected by things like the food that they eat. Right, so she's discovered that, so these are beads, these little tiny beads that are the size of a Paris toy egg. And she's discovered that toxins in the plant uh, will poison the immune system of caterpillars such that, they're, that it doesn't work anymore. So here's a caterpillar that has a perfectly functioning immune system because one of the things the immune system does is it melanizes around a foreign object. So all these cells glob onto it and they put melanin all over it. And so they turn black. Uh, so a bead that's turned black indicates a perfectly functioning immune system. A red bead, and she's dyed them red, means that there's no melanization whatsoever, the immune system doesn't work. So she's been doing some very cool stuff to look at how uh, changes in plant chemistry or maybe uh, introduction of insecticides uh, will affect the immune response of, of caterpillars. And she'll talk about how this links into all these other questions we've been discussing. But I like to throw this in there because you all will be doing some other things. You won't just be collecting caterpillars and throwing them in bags. You're gonna do a little bit of chemistry, come down here and do a little bit of chemistry. Uh, you you will um, the last group worked with Will the guy who's getting married uh, with his uh, uh, multitrophic interactions where mosquitoes are the focal organism instead of caterpillars and that kind of shows how our data with our caterpillar interactions can be applied to other kinds of ecosystems. And in fact, Will came to work in our lab because he was interested in the general questions, not specifically in, in caterpillars. Uh, so uh, I, I'm pretty sure you will get a chance to go into the field one day with Will. And actually, the last group really liked that day because they went to a beautiful one of his sites. is really, really nice. Right, so I just uh, like to point out that there are these related topics and that because we have to focus on particular host plants, one of our focal plants uh, is juniper. And you will be sampling off of juniper a lot to try to, to, try to document interaction diversity on juniper. So you've got um, one of these today. You've got a big Lycaenid mm -hmm. caterpillar. A lot of juniper caterpillars are stunningly similar to the, uh, to the leaves that they're mm -hmm. feeding on. They're really hard to see. Uh, everybody saw the caterpillars today, right? Yeah. Uh, this is my favorite one. I don't think you'll get any. Um, they don't typically make it this far out west, but you might. They do make it out here. This is, these guys get to be about that big. And believe it or not, you can't even see them still, even when they're that big, as big as a hot dog. This one's called Sphinx Dahlia. There's its little, it's a hornworm, there's its little horn there. Uh, but the, the caterpillars on juniper are really, really nice. Um, and juniper is very interesting and diverse, uh, and, and supports a really diverse fauna. So that's it, that's enough for today. Uh, fortunately, you didn't have to do, I would have done a much shorter talk if we'd done the chemistry also, but. We'll save the chemistry talk for a little bit later. I really would like, you know, it's great for teachers to see a world class. I mean, this chemistry facility is world class. We, you know, all the equipment is, is top of the line. And Chris does a really nice job of, of explaining how natural products chemistry is done. So I think it's, it's really good. And it's, it's an important part of our project. The last thing that I want to mention is that uh, whenever I give talks uh, and I you know, whenever you give a talk at a university, you always have an acknowledgement slide. And I always put Earthwatch volunteers up at the top and show a picture of the team, usually. Uh, I love working with, with Earthwatch volunteers, and I really appreciate uh, all of the hard work that Earthwatch volunteers have contributed to, to our projects. 
Uh, and so I you know, just want to thank you ahead of time for being here and, and working with us, working with Nick and, and the rest of us. Uh, and I, I, hope you, I hope you find it educational and enjoyable. The research station is, is very nice. So if you were hot today, it's, it's summertime, it's warm up there, but it's not nearly as hot up there. You're up uh, many thousands of feet higher. It's a really nice meadow. It was that hot today. Peaceful, was it? it really? No, it really wasn't. That was a hot day it's today. <laughs> so, I felt pretty hot today. I was like, oh my god, there's suffering out there. <laughs> so, are there any questions? Are there other questions other than what you've already asked? Nothing? No? <laughs> Just going back to your research in um, New Orleans. So, after Katrina, you your project ended. What was that? Yeah, well, we, we, had, we just started it over. So that was funded by the Department of Energy, and uh, it's a, they have a, one uh, program the Department of Energy is focused on how climate change affects productivity of ecosystems in the United States. And alfalfa is everywhere, so it's a major ecosystem in the United States. And so that was funded by that. And after Katrina, um, I called the funding agency and said, you know, that that's it, we don't have any data. And so they, they actually gave us more funding to, to redo it. We redid the whole thing. So we have the results now, but it took, from the start to the end, it took about eight years to do, to do all of that. But there are really interesting results, and we're gonna do more of that. And eventually we'll start doing more of that with, volunteers worked on that, that project too in, in New Orleans. Uh, so eventually we'll be doing more here in the lab here with, with people. And that's why it's good to see the chemistry, because. Like, like the effects of, of temperature and CO2 are huge on chemistry, which uh, has big effects on caterpillars and their immune systems and then on parasitoids and how well they control caterpillars. And chemistry mediates all of these interactions. Uh, I didn't talk about it much in this talk, but it is an important part of what we do. Do you yeah. know anyone doing similar research on interactions but with like, non-parasite? That, so documenting interaction diversity is, is, has been tough. People, what the traditional way is that food web approach. And so it's not done very often. What people do is they try to get their whole food web in place, so hardly anybody does it. And so this is a completely new idea. And, and I've, I've given a lot of talks of, uh, since we've done the models and, and published these papers. And, there are a lot of people working in pollination that are really interested in adopting this approach, and then in competition as well. Uh, so, but there is a guy, um, Jordi Basconti, uh, who's from Spain, who does, uh, he's got very well resolved pollination food webs. I still think they're missing a lot, but you know, they've got pretty decent webs, and he also uh, documents interaction diversity for, for pollination. And he has some of the same conclusions as we do that. The more, the higher the interaction diversity, the more stable the ecosystem. But we don't, and the thing is, we because we can't document it, we have no idea how interaction diversity is responding to perturbations or you know, how it even varies across a simple elevational gradient. And that's another thing you'll notice is we'll sample at a lot of different elevations, and one of our questions is how does the elevation affect interaction diversity? Yeah. 